Hi, and welcome class to our series of lectures on chapter 10, which is all about membrane transport. And our first part of this lecture in this video, we're going to be considering the thermodynamics of transport, more from a conceptual point of view than a really quantitative point of view, like when we did thermodynamics in the very beginning of this course. So overall, in this chapter, we're going to cover three main topics. First, in this first video, we'll cover the thermodynamics of transport from a more conceptual point of view. And then once we have those in mind, we'll go on to consider passive mediated transport as well as active transport. So let's start thinking about transporting subjects, uh, substances, excuse me, across cellular membranes. So there are a number of substances that have to go both in and out of cells. These include a bunch of different ions, things like fuel or energy sources, such as sugar or fuel itself, such as ATP. Waste needs to be sent out of the cell. Some proteins need to be sent both out and into the cell. Uh, hormones uh, need to be able to signal within a cell, and finally water needs to be able to pass back and forth, uh, depending on the osmotic pressure, of course. So let's start thinking about some of the differences between these types of substances. So different types of molecules, in particular ions, um, require different types of transport. So the first, maybe most, maybe simple type of transport is non-mediated transport, which is just simple diffusion. So this applies to molecules that are nonpolar, um, including molecules such as steroids, as well as oxygen. And these types of molecules are able to pass in and out of the cell just simply based on a concentration gradient. So they can diffuse out based on that concentration gradient, or they can diffuse in. The next type of transport to consider is mediated transport. And this is often, and the, the objects that mediate this type of mediated transport are often membrane proteins. So proteins sitting on the outside surface of the cell that will admit particular substances. Um, and this generally uh, applies to ionic and polar substances, in particular ions such as sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride ions. Um, in addition to that, we um, also We'll frequently see other particularly polar substances, such as various metabolites of different processes, as well as amino acids, sugars, nucleotides, and water. Um, these all need to be able to pass in and out of the cell, depending on the needs of the cell and the environment. And this is done, again, through that mediated transport, so using frequently membrane proteins that help these substances pass through, because they're not able to simply pass through with simple diffusion, like we saw with those nonpolar molecules. Um, and then another type of transport that we've discussed a little bit in previous chapters is through endocytosis and exocytosis, and this is the use of vesicles. So vesicles are more frequently used to transport um, proteins and other much larger molecules in and out of the cell. Um, they might be too large to simply use something like mediated transport through a membrane protein. They need a whole vesicle to sort of encapsulate them and leave them where they need to go. So first, now let's start to think about mediated transport um, to dig more into that a little bit. So mediated transport, there are different classes of it, and they are classified by their energy requirements. So the first one we'll type we'll consider is passive mediated transport, which is which we'll also call facilitated diffusion. Um, just something to keep in mind, this is not the same as simple diffusion, which does not use mediated transport at all. This is passive mediated transport, so we're, we're helping with diffusion, facilitated diffusion. Um, and this is separate from active mediated transport. So what is the two difference of these? Um, again, this is about all about energy requirements. So passive mediated transports are helping out with movement across a membrane that is already spontaneous, meaning that the Gibbs free energy is less than zero. So um, these types of movements across a membrane would happen spontaneously, but often they'll happen very, very slowly. And so we use passive mediated transport or facilitated diffusion to help um, these movements across the membrane go faster. But they are going sort of with that energy gradient, um, and, and it's a spontaneous reaction. It doesn't require the input of energy. Um, this is different from active mediated transport. Active mediated transport is helping out a non-spontaneous movement across a membrane where delta G is greater than zero. And so active mediated transport is going to require some sort of energy input to help overcome that non-spontaneous movement. 
And so, yeah, that brings up our second point, which is for passive media to transport, the molecules are moving down that electrochemical potential gradient, which we'll talk about in a moment, versus active mediated transport, in which molecules are moving up the electrochemical potential gradient. Excuse me. And so, and of course, this goes along with the requirement of energy. So for passive mediated transport, there is no requirement for additional energy inputs. For, whereas for active mediated transport, there is a requirement of energy, which is often from ATP or using an existing gradient. Um, so you can often have one, one set of molecules going down a gradient coupled with another set of molecules going up a gradient and one essentially is paying for the other in terms of spontaneity. So let's now think more about what it means to have an electrochemical potential and what how this might impact transport across a membrane. So in the environment with a cell, um, there are going to always be molecules and ions that are on both sides of a cell's membrane, both inside and outside of a cell that are just existing, they, they're already there. Um, and so whatever molecules and ions are already there on each side of the membrane are going to impact how other types of molecules and ions are able to move across that same membrane. So let's break that down a little bit. So there's two, so as part of electrochemical potential, we have two sort of components. So the first component is the chemical potential. Um, and this depends solely on the concentration of a molecule or an ion. Um, and so, um, and so when we think about chemical potential moving down that gradient, um, molecules and ions are going to spontaneously move towards the side of the membrane that has a lower concentration of that particular molecular ion, just like we would think of for any type of diffusion, um, where the molecules are going to want to spread out and move towards where there is a lower concentration. Um, similar but different, we have the electrical potential, and this depends on the charge. And so the spontaneous movement from an electrical potential point of view is specifically talking about ions. And ions are going to spontaneously move towards the side that has an opposite charge. Um, this is more favorable and spontaneous, right? And so if you combine them together now, we have um, the electrochemical potential, which we, and we can also talk about the membrane potential. And so the membrane potential, which we can measure, is a measure of excuse me, the difference in charge across a membrane. And this is always, excuse me, from the perspective of the inside of the cell. So if there's a negative environment, negatively charged environment inside the cell, we would, we would say that that cell has a negative membrane potential. Um, and this is again, related to the electrical potential because it's all about charge. When we combine them together for our electrochemical potential gradient, um, that's how we can essentially help to predict the movement of molecules or ions um, because the movement of molecules and ions will occur spontaneously down that electrochemical potential gradient, both depending on the concentration as well as the charge in the environments on either side of that membrane. Um, so now that we've thought about all of those concepts behind types of transport and the thermodynamics of transport, you are now ready to answer the thermodynamics of transport practice questions.